one of the things that uh, uh, make a lot of uh, um, coverage is how, for example, a campaign that started in Egypt that uh, started online that tells people to, uh, because there was a garbage problem and the municipal council were not doing their job after the revolution of making sure that the companies uh, collect garbage. So they, they started a call online for people to throw their garbage at the municipal council. So there are pictures of you know, piles of garbage and all the municipal council. There is also uh, the idea of using internet as election monitoring tool. Uh, crowdsourcing using a website like Yushahidi for people to participate and show and uh, uh, express their uh, uh, testimonies about what happened in the election station, if there were rigging, uh, pictures and uh, videos, if any, uh, about evidence of attacks or violence or intimidation. So these are all kind of uh, efforts to help legitimize the election process. Thank you very much. Yeah. Over here. Maybe I can speak loud. Yeah, I got it. Thank you very much for the outstanding examples and talks. My question is how the governments in this country are using the same media. Mm -hmm. um, did Mubarak use Facebook, Twitter to counteract the revolution? What happened in Syria? Were they using the same? Do they sabotage the... <coughs> Thank you. Yeah, indeed, uh, it has a, a great influence. Uh, after a while, after the uh, social media revolution was uh, launched, and after the revolution indeed was launched in Syria, the government uh, created a group called Syri Syrian uh, Syria uh, Cyber Army. It was a group to uh, uh, deactivate other groups and uh, other people's accounts in order to, you know, limit their abilities to be active on Facebook. So of course, if it had any uh, effect on the on the ground, the government would uh, launch such a move. Hold on one second. My DP tells me that it'll look better from the stage. So if you guys don't mind, sorry about that. Good idea. And while that's happening, let's get the next question. Uh, question and comment. First on the comment side, Devin, I was tweeting while you were uh, talking about Bahrain and some people from Bahrain wrote back and said one of the reasons we have to use the social media so much is that the international media isn't covering what we're what's happening here uh, and um, the other thing I, I was really shocked about in uh, Bahrain is I kept giving people my business card we were there last week and um, said can you email me these photos can you email me this, this? and they kind of looked at me strange and said yeah yeah sure and then at the end, as I was leaving, I realized nobody uses email. Uh, and how much is that common in the Middle East? And then um, lastly, the uh, other comment I, I heard people making in places like Bahrain were that uh, when you do put this stuff out uh, over Twitter, yeah, a lot of people will try to congregate, let's meet at X, X spot. But of course, uh, the government and the military are all watching those. And so they're stopping you every time you go. Uh, so they're trying to find, you know, how can you be using the social media but not have the uh, government always knowing what to do. Um, I think I know what the questions are, but um, let me go, I go straight. Well, regarding um, Bahrainis, uh, as I said before, the, the level of social media literacy, um, they're beyond email. They, they literally are beyond email. And, you know, Twitter gives you a certain, um, you can find anyone, you can basically, it's like bumping into somebody at a party and just talking with them. I mean, I, yeah, I just, before this talk, uh, with this Lulu Live, we posted a few things. I said, hey, there's some more posts on Lulu Live. And somebody emailed back and, and said something like, um, these aren't protesters, these are kids. Why don't you shut your ugly face? That's, that's a typical Bahraini tweet that I'll get. But it's because they feel they can approach me and it, it feels like you can converse with these people. Um, kind of going to your question also, social media is really designed for our conversation. And in fact, the reason why we launched the site is because 
really the model is not taking information and broadcasting into a country. That's true in the few countries left, maybe Myanmar, but not even Myanmar anymore. I and mean, then it's opening up, but really it's about what's being said there and how do you understand the, the data and the conversations and what is happening. Uh, talking about um, social media, let's take, um, I think social media gets a little tricky when you start talking about intractable crises. So for example, let's take Bahrain in Syria and contrast it to say Tunisia and Egypt. Tunisia was sort of a fluke, it happened very quickly. Egypt was sort of seizing on that moment in the immolation of Bozizi. And, it was, and, and Mubarak had the sense to, to step down when the pressure was, was too much from his people and probably from outside. Um, I don't think Bashar al-Assad is planning on stepping down anytime soon. Um, and people are certainly mobilizing through social media and revolting, and we're not actually seeing anything happening. And this could go on for several months more, and you won't expect to see action in the UN Security Council. Bahrain. I don't think the monarchy is, is leaving. They may reform or they may start dialogue, but see, social media is very useful when you have a particular goal in mind. Let's get rid of the guy who's been there for a long time, Yemen as well. But in these places where the person's not going to leave easily, or maybe even some of the populace don't want that person to leave because of stability, social, there's something called social media, media fatigue. You actually, Occupy Wall Street, there's a little bit of that, though. Hopefully, when things you know warm up, maybe people will come out again. But I think what you see is when you have a clear goal, like what Sharif was saying, social media is most effective. When we start talking about building a country, or we're talking about something besides revolt, it gets a little more tricky in how you use that. Um, so it's really good for, for mobilizations and clear goals. It's, it, when you're talking about near civil war or things like that, it's still useful, uh, but it's more complicated. Yeah, and, uh, Sharif, I don't need a mic. So, Sharif, um, you mentioned in the beginning of your presentation <coughs> that there were grievances that that caused the um, Egyptians that use social media to use social media to get attention and, and to provide a protest. But what I don't find covered are the underlying grievances. So, what under like beyond beyond the protests? And beyond getting out into social media and saying, you know, we want to be paid attention to, what's what's the plan? Or because it's decentralized, they may not they may not be a plan. But what what efforts are there to get uh, beyond the the protests out there, the issues out? Well, the main grievance is uh, the country has been held cast, you know in custody of Mubarak and his family and his group for 30 years. Mm -hmm. And with frequent promises of change, 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 and nothing happened. <coughs> the idea was we cannot wait anymore and it's his time to leave. This happens particularly after the election, not just because of Tunisia. The last parliamentary election of 2010 happened in November, two months before the revolution, and it was the worst election in terms of free, uh, freedom and uh, ability for political parties to compete. Then Mubarak, who has been in power for 30 years, started to reclaim himself as if he was running again in 2011 to compete and stay for six more years. So that was kind of like, yeah, people said, no, we cannot wait six more years. We cannot have one more flawed election. And they just needed an opportunity, uh, a way to make that happen. And I think with Tunisia, there was a momentum and with all the social media mobilization, there was already a grassroots social capital and a movement that could be mobilized. And it was a matter of deciding on a date. And that was what the Facebook group and the coalition building that happened around it made it happen. Over there, do you need the mic? That's okay. Uh, in your 
thank you for your presentation. My name is Sarah Danish, and my question is for all three panelists. Uh, you're probably well aware that within the State Department, the United States State Department, there is a Bureau of Democracy, Rights, and Labor, and within there, there's an Internet Freedom Team. Um, what I'd like to know from each of you is what is the role of such a unit um, and maybe that of other governments who might create a similar unit. What, what should they be doing according to you and maybe within that and also what shouldn't they be doing? Well, I, I can provide some advice and I think what we've seen here is that in the matter of access and access should be a highest priority. And I think if any if anything the US government can do and any democratic government is that make sure internet access is part of any uh, economic and uh, developmental and even political discussion with any uh, government any other government, especially if those governments were taking money or subsidies from the US. Internet access is just a way for people to use for whatever reason they want. It shouldn't be threatening and it shouldn't be uh, uh, you know, just uh, oppressing internet should be justified at all. The other thing is also ensuring that the, there isn't any use of um, companies subsidizing oppression. And that's not just from governments, but also from people like Google, Skype, any major companies who provide their services would not be pressured by oppressive governments to give up information, to self-censor their uh, services, or to share uh, information, because that happened in other ways, in China, was you know uh, some of the uh, pressure that was exerted in Google, and also with Skype, we've seen that some of the companies in Europe have actually collaborated with the Egyptian government, for example, on providing software that can hack into Skype and reveal uh, personal and private Skype conversations. So those are very crucial issues in terms of privacy and access, but I think the US government and any democratic government can help it. I might add something to that. Yeah. In my opinion, government, or well, Tunisians and uh, Egyptians actually uh, uh, had benefited from the uh, fact that their government were uh, good allies with the West. Egypt was the best, probably after Israel was the best ally to uh, to the U.S. Uh, same thing uh, with uh, Tunisia was one of the best France allies in, in North Africa and Middle Eastern region. Um, so meanwhile, from 2005 up to 2010, uh, 11, there was kind of cooperation between civil society movement uh, within these two countries and uh, Western uh, uh, civic uh, movement. There were, I had a lot of Tunisian friends who would come to the U.S. and get training needed uh, to become uh, future uh, or possible uh, cyber activists, which it did, which did happen after after the revolution was uh, after the, the revolution erupted. Well, it didn't ha uh, it didn't happen in uh, Syria, and it's not happening in Bahrain, even though Bahrain is a good ally uh, to the U.S. and the West as well. Uh, same thing with Iran. The Green Revolution. Iran was, you know, a model to the whole Middle Eastern countries, but it didn't, it didn't, uh, it wasn't able to last because of like because Iran, Iran was iso an isolated country for the last thirty years probably, and uh, the people, including the opposition, weren't able to even communicate even socially with the outside country. Uh, this is uh, the outside environment. Uh, uh, same thing with with, with Syria. Syria lack the ability to um, have, well, have, they have the opportunity to communicate with you. So I think there are initiatives, but there are plans by, there's nothing at least the partnership initiative who have a certain budget to help these movements uh, in, in the Middle East and North Africa. 
but it, uh, it doesn't seem to be working uh, since, uh, as I mentioned, Daryl, the lack of ability to get to these people on the ground. Um, I don't know what the State Department should do, but um, I think, well, I got a slightly different take on this. If you remember back in the Egyptian Revolution when Mubarak shut down the internet for three or four days, um, so I've lived in Egypt, and you know, Egyptians rely, they, they actually subsidized the internet very early. Everybody had at least a dial-up connection if they had a PC. Um, banking, there was online banking when I was there, and this was like 10 years ago. When you shoot, shut down the internet and try to censor it heavily, you shoot yourself in the foot and also your businesses and also communication. So I think one of the things you can do is promote private sector growth in any business that relies upon the internet because any of these countries that is having censorship problems, say Syria, Syria's economy is skewed to one or two dominant sectors um, and their internet is very closed, but there's no way they're going to be able to expand into other sectors and be part of the, the economy. And as long as the economy is weak, then any regime is also vulnerable. So I think you, uh, when I lived in Dubai, for example, there were certain sections where you'd work uh, and you couldn't have access to the internet. People just moved to some other real estate where you had that. I mean, I think free commerce and use of the internet is the best way to sort of open things up. So if the State Department can actually encourage internet reliance in all sectors, then these regimes will realize that it's pretty much futile to try to block it whether it's certain companies or, or during crisis. Uh, for five or six years, I've been part of a group uh, that the AFL-CIO set up of connecting with Iraqi labor unions. Now, of course, labor unions were denied. The U.S. government never supported labor unions in Iraq. But, uh, they have brought uh, labor union people to America and have had meetings, etc. My question, uh, I never, never hear about labor unions in Egypt or Tunisia or anywhere. And of course, I see them as critical to a revolution at whatever stage. And so, are they allowed? Are there such things? Do they have any influence, any weight? To, uh, thank you. Well, in, in Egypt, I mentioned briefly in 2008 that uh, the first Facebook group that managed to mobilize around 100,000 people in April 6, uh, they started with um, a call to support uh, labor unions and workers who the the last year, the previous year of 2007, on April 6, staged a, a huge strike that had more than 25,000 people and uh, asked the, the government to increase their wages. And the government said they will, so they went home. And one year later, they haven't uh, fulfilled their promise. So in the first anniversary is actually where the Facebook organizers decide on that day to express solidarity with the workers and called for a national strike on that day. And on April 6, 2008, uh, estimates are that around 30 to 40 percent of the people stayed home, did not go to work or to school, to express their solidarity. So of course they were part of this, they were of course one of the leading force during the protest in January last year, uh, one of the final actions that was taken to force Mubarak to leave was civil disobedience and started on February 7, February 8 and within three to four days Mubarak had to leave because all over the country, no one showed up to work. Um, that's my uh, uh, two cents of that. Anyone else? Uh, 